Well, good morning. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is the last grand round of 2018, and we will resume after today in uh, January of 2019. So today we're talking about uh, blood flow restriction training. We have two great speakers today. We have uh, Dr. Greg Colvin, who is uh, who went to school at University of Scranton, and he is a certified Mulligan practitioner and a certified athletic trainer as well. He practices at our Moravian location. And then we also have uh, Mr. Rick Grubb, who uh, is a board certified orthopedic specialist. And he uh, went to Ithaca College. And uh, he practices at our uh, Mukunji location. Two M's, sorry. So, without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Please make sure you do sign in and pick up a certificate um, and also uh, provide your feedback. And we'd also love to hear uh, feedback of topics that you would like to hear in the future as well. So, take it away. All right, thank you very much uh, for having us here today. Um, so, I'm going to talk to you about blood flow restriction training. Uh, just off the bat, we have no kind of financial relationships uh, to disclose here. Uh, I've been a therapist for 16 years, and I'll tell you that this blood flow restriction training is the most exciting thing that I've seen in these 16 years of practicing. It has such a um, potential, a high potential um, to help our patients, and it's very easy to administer. We're going to get into that more, but um, I've been passionate about it since I found out about it, and it's nice to meet uh, someone else who feels the same way, and Greg. And uh, it's exciting enough to bring an Eagles fan and a Cowboys fan together. That gives you an indication <laughs> of the magnitude of it. Um, so today, um, what we want to do is make sure you get, a, you get an idea of the history of blood flow restriction training, um, to understand some of the theories behind why this works. Um, there's uh, an evidence base that we're going to review. Um, go over the potential safety concerns, precautions, contraindications. Um, and give you an idea of, of what the indications would be and how to um, administer this and the exercise prescription of the use of blood flow restriction. So what is PDFR? So the P in there is personalized. Um, and that's something that, that is important and we're going to really get into that later. But um, blood flow restriction therapy is the use of a surgical grade tourniquet put on a limb at the most proximal part of the limb. Um, it includes venous outflow 100%, and it reduces arterial inflow to the musculature. And um, it allows you, the, the, really the main takeaway with this is it allows you to exercise at a low load, but get the same systemic effects and the same as effects as far as building strength and muscular hypertrophy as you would get with high intensity training. Okay, that's the main idea behind this. Um, so you could you can get strength gains by using light weights or no weight, weights at all. Um, and uh, so it's less stress on the joint. You can do strength training in uh, non-weight bearing environments and still, still make gains there. This is just an example of uh, someone doing squats with the cuff. Whatever muscle group, anything distal to the cuff, you can target. The world is your oyster. So if he was doing calf raises, you'd, you'd be focusing on the, uh, you'd be getting calf strength and calf muscle hypertrophy. So here we're focusing mainly on the quads, but um, you can use it for many different exercises. This is Dr. Yoshiaki Sato. Um, this is the, he's the godfather of <laughs> occlusion therapy. So uh, in the 60s in Japan, the story goes that he was kneeling and he felt his leg fell asleep. And, you know, I don't know exactly the course of action that occurred this, but he started, to, he was thinking, oh, this is because I'm, I'm restricting blood flow. So he started experimenting with bicycle tires, ropes, different things to occlude blood flow to his limbs. Um, and he was later involved in a skiing accident where he tore ligaments in his knee, he fractured his ankle. And they had casted him. They cast his leg at that time. And um, when the cast was removed, the doctors were astounded that he didn't have the atrophy that they would normally expect to see. And he attributed it to what he was doing, these crazy experiments on himself. Um, and, and that's where it kind of came from. That was in the 60s.
So then the next, um, the, this modern day interpretation of this, this intervention um, actually came through the US military. And this guy here is a physical therapist. His name is Johnny Owens. Um, he was working at the Center for the Intrepid, um, and he was in charge of the limb salvaging program. So with these IEDs, these explosive devices, um, soldiers were coming back with uh, really traumatic and kind of mangled limbs. And then the question was, do we just do an amputation or do we try to rehab uh, these, these soldiers and see if we can get, get along without you know, doing something so extreme? But the problem being multifaceted pain, lack of muscle mass, inability to bear weight. Um, so he had heard of occlusion therapy. And um, he wanted to kind of, uh, he, he was basically willing to try anything, but he wanted to make it more scientific, more objective. Um, and that's where the modern day interpretation of this blood flow restriction came to be. So it went from the use in the military to Owen's recovery science. So basically from the, he's not working there anymore with, with the US military, it went from military to professional sports teams. Okay, um, and that's all the, professional sports teams are using this now. Okay. Locally, the fans are using it. Um, so it's, it's them, it's for pro sports teams in St. Louis for right now. So when you hear about blood flow restriction training, it does kind of have a kind of scary connotation to it. Um, it's one thing we have to really educate our patients about, at, you know, when, I'm, when we're going to be using it in the clinic is, why are you restricting blood flow to your leg or to your arm? Um, and one thing that comes to mind almost immediately is DVT. Can you get a DVT from this? So there are several studies to support the fact that uh, just non-specifically short-term use of a tourniquet does not increase the, uh, the chances of getting a DVT. And there are some specific studies um, with the use of blood flow restriction. And in fact, um, short duration tourniquet use actually increases TPA, which is, has this fibrinolytic protein uh, fibrinolytic potential, so that's anticoagulatory, um, and that increases significantly. It increases significantly in the short term after blood flow restriction training. Um, this study here, 2014, um, use of a venous Doppler after four weeks of blood flow restriction training, no thrombus formation measured. Um, one of the studies I was reading said there's out of the 300,000 training sessions, 0.06 percent incidence of uh, DVT. So we, we uh, talked to orthopedists a lot. We've been going around making some rounds discussing this. And uh, just last week, we were, we were talking to a surgeon. He brought up this point, which is exactly right. In the OR, can, can a patient have surgery? Are they safe enough to have surgery? In the OR, the tourniquet time is much more um, than the six to eight minutes per exercise that we're using. And the tourniquet pressure is much higher uh, because they're completely occluding blood flow. We're only partially occluding blood flow. So if they're safe enough to have surgery, they should be safe enough to use uh, blood flow restriction therapy. So the stroke volume, you're getting less venous return, okay? While it's on, you're getting no venous return from that extremity. So decreased stroke volume. So in order to compensate for this, your heart rate goes up to maintain your cardiac output. Um, so you'll feel like when you're using this with no weight, you'll feel like you're doing a high intensity exercise as far as your heart beating faster, you'll sweat, your blood pressure will go up. They're comparable, but still not quite at the same levels as um, you would get with a high intensity workout. Mm -hmm. But this, um, this is an important slide here. These are the cuffs that we use, okay? This is the Delphi system. Um, PVFR versus VFR. If you see somebody like this in the gym, they're doing blood flow restriction, but they're not doing it objectively, okay? And that can be dangerous. The P, the personalized blood flow restriction, this system uses a Doppler, it says Doppler-like system to measure the amount of flow through the limb. So it gives you a measurement, it's called a limb occlusion pressure of what would be 100% <laughs> of arterial occlusion. And then you back it down from there. So you know when you're using this device that you're not fully occluding blood flow. If you're using this, you don't know that. Um, the wider cuff here versus the narrow cuff here. So uh, increased surface area, less stress on the neurovascular structures. With the wider cuff, 
you have a lower pressure needed for occlusion. So what we want to do is use the lowest possible pressure to still get the same, the best beneficial effects. Do you have anything else to add on that one? There's a product being marketed as B. Oh, yeah. So there's this B, it's being marketed around, we have Valley actually, it's called Be Strong. And it's basically, it looks like this with a blood pressure gauge on it. All right. The problem being with that is exactly what I said. Unless you also have a Doppler at the same time as you're administering this, you can't, you will not know what the limb occlusion pressure is. So they're basing, for example, like in the upper extremity, they just say use 200 millimeters of mercury. Use 200 as your force. It's kind of a random number. Okay. We're going to base it, we're going to have objective differences for each patient that uses this. That's the Delphi system. This is a system that's being used um, by the professional sports teams. The most common side effects, bruising around the tourniquet site. These are the most common side effects reported in the literature. I've never seen this. Um, soreness, mild soreness, certainly transient paresthesia, swelling in the limb, and fatigue. And again, uh, just compared to even the general population, the chance of a DVT is less. So just like any kind of uh, modality exercise that we would administer in a therapeutic setting, there are precautions or contraindications. Um, I go through this list with each patient before I do this. We go through, we make sure they don't, as far as we know, don't have any of these conditions. Um, they also do sign a consent uh, to treat with blood flow restriction in our clinic. Um, severe, hyper, or severe hypertension. So if someone's if someone is taking medication or hypertension is controlled, they'd still be a candidate to use this. Um, you'll see creatine supplementation as a precaution. There's one um, study or there's one case of a uh, collegiate level hockey player developing rhabdo. But the, when you look at the, the big picture of this, he was also doing high intensity training and he was taking high doses of creatine. So this was part of his program. Um, there's no muscle breakdown with blood flow restriction there. So, the chances of getting rabid is a high intensity should be less, but um, there is one um, reported case of that. Sickle cell anemia. <clears throat> so um, the general systemic effects, there's a lot of systemic effects of blood flow restriction training. Um, as I mentioned before, your stroke volume will decrease. Um, same thing happens a lot of times with high intensity training, that's from the muscular occlusion of the blood vessels as you're, as you're um, doing high intensity workout. A um, couple points here, the muscle damage, like I just discussed, nothing with the blood flow restriction, but you will get muscle damage with the high intensity training. Blood pressure will go up with both, heart rate will go up with both, fibrinolytic potential we discussed will go up with both. Um, Post-occlusion blood flow. If you use blood flow restriction therapy chronically, if you use it for a few weeks, same with a chronic high-intensity workout, you'll have an increased post-occlusion uh, blood flow. There's a lot of systemic effects we're going to go over shortly. And at this time, I'll give it over to Greg to talk about some of the theory behind this. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. All right. So. I'm going to talk to you about two uh, theories that support blood flow restriction. Uh, it is the metabolite theory and the cell swelling theory. So the metabolite theory basically uh, is based on the premise of the, the cascade effect that uh, begins with the lactate production. Uh, there's multiple components of the metabolite theory. So it's the lactate production, muscle activation, growth hormone, and satellite uh, and inter, I mean, IGF-1 and satellite cells, uh, as well as myostatin. So insulin growth factor one, for those that didn't know IGF-1, I briefly forgot it. But um, so here are diagrams of the Cori cycle and the Krebs cycle. Um, the human body produces energy through different types of metabolism. The Krebs cycle or the citric cycle uses pyruvate and is associated with aerobic metabolism, whereas the Cori cycle, which is on the left, uh, or lactic acid cycle, uses lactate and it's associated with anaerobic metabolism. The Cori cycle is closely associated with blood flow restriction. So 
this picture here, blood flow restriction and high intensity training share many of the same physiological principles, um, but there's an important difference. Blood flow restriction does not require or does not follow the mechanical tension model, meaning we don't need high loads in order to uh, gain hypertrophy. Uh, the limited oxygen supply forces the body to switch from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And the utilization of BFR makes patients feel the burn, or more specifically, the lactate burn. So lactate production stimulates muscle activation. So working out in a hypoxic state stimulates lactate production. Using BFR, which causes a hypoxic state, increases motor, 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 motor unit recruitment. And in fact, it will uh, activate more fast twitch fibers than slow twitch fibers. This is pretty fascinating because usually if we're lifting, we have to go through a process where we activate slow twitch first, and then we activate fast twitch. So this can help us skip over the middleman and slow twitch muscle fibers. So as we said, lactate production stimulates muscle activation. It also stimulates growth hormone. Um, do we have any baseball fans here? Uh, Yankee fans specifically. And <laughs> So when I look back, I think about Andy Pettit, and when he was coming back from his Tommy John surgery, he required, he was caught taking growth hormone. Growth hormone has no effect on athletic performance. In fact, like now that I understand its role, I was like, Andy was pretty, uh, a little bit ahead of his time. So uh, basically, growth hormone does not affect the athletic performance. Growth hormone protects our tendons and muscle collagen after exercise. So BFR and low intensity exercise leads to that increase in lactate, which leads to an increase in growth hormone, which increases collagen synthesis. So uh, recently, there's been a study performed by Dr. James Andrews, world-renowned physician, uh, and Owens Recovery Science that looked at BFR two weeks prior to the plasma-rich platelet uh, draws. And they've you have said that they've seen better results with doing BFR prior to the PRP draw than if versus patients that just had the PRP draw. So this is it's pretty pretty exciting stuff. And you know, so you might be wondering why there's baking soda on the screen. So basically, um, when I was in undergrad, I took an exercise physiology class and we were talking about cyclists that were trying to find the ways to combat the negative effect of lactic acid. Uh, basically, lactic acid will lead us to muscles to fatigue, to get us to get tired. Um, so they ingested sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, and they were able to retard the negative effect of lactic acid. Uh, however, this <laughs> did not come without any like uh, repercussions. They had gastrointestinal distress, and they pretty much had explosive diarrhea after this. <laughs> uh, I'll never forget my teacher very dry, and he goes, I mean, they had liftoff. So, <laughs> so it, it, coming full circle, the sodium bicarbonate prevents lactic acid from stimulating the release of growth hormone. Um, this is also holds true for individuals with my, McCardle syndrome. McCardle syndrome, uh, in, in people do not uh, produce an enzyme called uh, myophosphorylase. Myophosphorylase helps break down lactic acid to stimulate uh, growth hormone as well. So these individuals have a hard time developing, hyper, or, yeah, developing hypertrophy throughout their bodies. And it also affect, can affect bones. So uh, what's also interesting about this is that the osteoblasts have receptors on them for uh, to stimulate the, uh, to receive growth hormone. Uh, by using the BFR, we can see an increase in VEGF and BAFP. So VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor, and bone alkaline phosphatase is basically just a marker that researchers were using uh, to determine if there was osteoblastic activity. Um, the VEGF is significant because it increases the subsequent blood vessel formation into the bone after a fracture. So it will promote, get more blood flow into the fracture site, leading to hopefully a quicker uh, uh, recovery time. Now we come to our IGF-1 and our satellite cells. So IGF-1 is a protein in humans that's linked to muscle growth. Uh, that gained notoriety, I believe, two, well, however many years ago, Alabama was in the national championship. So 
some of their players were taking antler, uh, a deer antler spray. So they were saying that has high contents of IGF. Um, so that's how that comes into play. Satellite cells, it's a precursor to skeletal muscle cells. So they're the stem cells for our muscles. Uh, growth hormone activates the satellite cells, and then IGF-1 monitors and fuses the satellite cells into the muscle fiber. So this depicts basically what would happen if we were post-exercise. The satellite cells are going to bind itself to the muscle fiber, and then the satellite uh, will stick up, and then your repaired fiber will go into the gaps or the like areas of damage. Basically, now imagine this. We will, like with the BFR, we don't have muscle breakdown. We essentially have new satellite cells, and we're getting uh, the addition of more myonuclei, which translates into significant increase in strength. So this is important because more myonuclei makes for better ability to maintain muscle during periods of detraining. Uh, for example, the Golden State Warriors, I mean, and practice uh, fourth quarter shots by putting on the blood flow restriction, so it gets them like very tired, and then they're practicing. I mean, that's why Clay Thompson and Kevin Durant can put up 50 a night. So uh, Steph's on the bench right now, but I didn't forget him. Uh, the other thing that's important, <laughs> too, is that you have um, you know, your football teams that usually lift at least once a week. If you're able to have a period of time where you're not breaking down muscle and you're able to basically get that lactate burn and maintain those gains that you did in the off season, it's very beneficial for a lot of those guys who spend millions on their bodies. <laughs> so, uh, so does anybody know what type of cow this is? Any takers? And as you can guess, it's not a very good steak. So, all right. So basically, that is the Belgian blue. And then uh, my gentleman over here, this guy, he is uh, a lot of memes were out there for him because he's like a jack two-year-old. Um, but they have something in common. Then, as you can guess, it has something to do with myostatin. They do not have uh, myostatin down regulation. So basically, by lacking myostatin, uh, they're able to bet, like develop better muscles. Um, when myostatin is down regulated, it allows myogenic stem, stem cells to proliferate in hypertrophy. So the decrease in myostatin is key for my mus muscular hypertrophy. Two ways to down-regulate myostatin is with high-intensity training and low blood flow restriction training with low, low loads. Um, myostatin also has another purpose, um, and it, stem it induces fibrosis. So interesting story about this was uh, myostatin was developed by our bodies like early in evolution. So basically, if our ancestors were out hunting and they tore their hamstring, um, I mean, they could possibly, because they're lame, they would possibly get hunted by saber-toothed tigers or something, and uh, if they could die if, like, the myostatin didn't, like, cause fibrosis formation. So hence the reason we don't really regenerate our muscle cells. It would take too much time and energy. So myostatin stimulates the uh, formation of fib uh, fibrosis. Myostatin should also have some dollar signs after its name because uh, developing a myostatin blocking drug would result in sales of 3.4 billion in annual sales. This is because it could combat the wasting diseases such uh, and sarcopenia as well as cachexia. Um, there is actually a drug out there now, the BYM338 myostatin blocking drug, and they're starting to do clinical trials on inclusion bottle my body myositis, uh, which is one of those muscle wasting diseases. The last theory that we'll touch upon is the cell swelling. Um, this is the other theory, yeah. Uh, basically, metabolite buildup via blood flow restriction with exercise has demonstrated positive effects. So the myocyte, which are muscle cells that are dehydrated, does not undergo protein synthesis. However, acute swelling has been shown to increase protein synthesis and pro suppress proteolysis. Proteolysis is the breakdown of protein. Besides potentially activating muscle protein synthesis, Cellular swelling may also shift metabolism to a lipolysis state and spare protein. Uh, fat breaks down and produces more energy than protein, so it would be, uh, I mean, another great way of implementing this into our practice. One thing um, Greg had mentioned, just to kind of put it in the big picture with the, the slide, let me see if I can just, this slide here is, Normal high intensity training, you get a net gain of, of strength, hypertrophy. It's gain minus breakdown. 
equals what, what you're left with. With blood flow restriction, it's gain minus nothing. There's no breakdown. Okay, so that's the potential again to get more strength gains there. So one thing that's great about this is, and it was kind of shocking to me uh, first learning about it, is how much evidence there is about blood flow restriction training um, over 160 peer reviewed articles. This isn't something that, it's not a gimmicky thing. It's not like the ad belt they used to have in the infomercial where you'd sit on the couch and you'd wear it and you get six pack abs. There's a lot of research behind this. And when we go, like I said, we've been making our rounds uh, to different groups. I can bring in my, my stack here and anything that I tell them, anything I tell you, I can back up with some kind of research. Um, there is a lack of research on specific post-op protocols, you know, ACL, rotator cuff. Those studies are being done right now, and we're actually hoping to get involved with that ourselves. Um, so I'm going to touch on some of the um, things that Greg talked about as far as the theories and try to give at least some evidence for each of those theories. So stem cells, myogenic stem cells, the satellite cells. Um, this was a study that just looked at the um, if there's proliferation of these stem cells with the use of blood flow restriction versus without it. Um, so 10 male subjects, they're just doing a long arc quad at a low load um, with BFR and without BFR. So 23 training sessions in a 19 day period and then a muscle biopsy um, was conducted. First at baseline, then eight days into training, and three and 10 days after training. So what this study showed was that the uh, stem cells increased by 280% mid training 250% three days after training and 140% even 10 days after the training was completed in the BFR group, but there's no increase at all uh, in the group that did not use the uh, blood flow restriction. The low, low, low training in isolation without the restriction should not give you strength gains or hypertrophy or the increase in stem cells. This is a pretty typical presentation of uh, acute post-op ACL. Notice the atrophy, um, so something that happens basically across the board, you know, with our ACLs. A lot of this too is the time between the injury and when they have the surgery. So pain, swelling leads to inhibition, leads to atrophy. Um, so this study um, is going to talk to the cellular swelling um, theory that he spoke of because in this study, the uh, patients did not do any exercise. Okay, so we're looking how can, is there a way to stop atrophy without doing anything really other than wearing a cup? So, um, to investigate the effect of inclusive stimulus of thigh muscles, status post ACL reconstruction. So, uh, this, is, this is a protocol that's used in a lot of the studies that talk about the cellular swelling. Five minutes of cuff time, take it off for three minutes, and then put it back on. So it's, it's five sets of that, 25 minutes of occlusion twice a day. So this was done acutely days three to 14 post-op. The control group still had the ACL reconstruction, but they just had a sham cuff on the limb. And then they did an MRI to look at the cross-sectional area of the quad on days three and 14. So in this, uh, these results, we don't want to see this getting larger. Uh, if the graph gets taller, that means there's more atrophy. Okay. So um, there was about a 21% um, loss <laughs> decrease in cross-sectional area in the control group and about a 9% loss in the experimental group. Again, this was without doing any exercise. So what if we added in just quad sets to this, something very basic? Maybe we would have completely stopped the atrophy. But those, those studies are being completed now. Um, this is uh, Wade Howard rehabbing from an injury with the cuff on right here. Um, this was a good study because we look at a couple different groups. We look at just low load training alone, low load training with the restriction, and then high intensity exercise. Let's compare all these three groups and see how they do. Um, and uh, the variables that were measured were lactic acid concentration. So I want to make sure I talk about that because that's one of the things we're saying that blood flow restriction is going to do. It's going to increase the lactic acid, which sets off this other chain of events, which can help build muscle. So that was conducted via blood draw. Um, strength with an isokinetic dynamometer, and then the cross-sectional area um, pre and post exercise via MRI. 16 week uh, by single arm dumbbell curl. So first we'll look at lactic acid. So this was the significant increase in lactic acid. This is in the, 
the low low group with the blood flow restrictions. Okay, no change in the high intensity group um, as far as no significant change there. So the mo the greatest increase in lactic acid was in the group that used the cuff with low low trim. Strength gains. So we saw strength gains in the high intensity group, significant strength gains. And we saw strength gains in the low intensity group with occlusion. These, these lines are the same. We don't want to see the same. The same means that there's no gains. That was um, the group without, uh, without the occlusion at the low intensity of exercise, and just an untrained control group. So again, is blood flow restriction training low intensity with the cuff equal to high intensity training? That's what we're trying to establish. Um, and then this was a look at the cross-sectional area after the exercise. So the greatest, if there was an increase in cross-sectional area across the board, but the greatest in increase was in the limb occlusion with the low load, okay? More than the high intensity training group. And then the tricep, there was also an increase in the cross-sectional area of the tricep, okay? This is the um, limb occlusion with the uh, low load. That's the high intensity. That's the low load alone. So we're just doing bicep curls. We weren't really, we weren't focusing on the tricep. There might have been some activation as a stabilizer. There might have been activation as we were returning. Maybe the tricep was activated. But there's actually an increase in the cross section, a significant increase in the cross sectional area of the tricep. Um, why would this occur? These systemic effects that we've talked about, you know, the systemic effects in the bloodstream. So another study I read recently, the cuff was just put on the thigh and patients did long arc, long arc quads, and they also trained their bicep. They did some light bicep curls. So you'll see hypertrophy and strength gains in the group that used the blood flow restriction on the leg. Okay, so it wasn't even on their arm. So even after, you know, what are the implications of this? So after a rotator cuff repair, could we use blood flow restriction on someone's thigh and have them do, you know, long arc quads or calf raises or ankle pumps or ride a bike? Would this promote healing? Would this promote strengthening of the rotator cuff without having to actually use that arm? Possibly. So this is a uh, blood flow restriction with riding the bike, which is a hard thing to do. Um, th this study looked at uh, VO2, the effects of VO2 max, endurance, thigh muscle volume, um, with biking with or without the, the cuff. So it was in this group, uh, it was, they were cycling at 40% VO2 max for 15 minutes with the cuff. And without the cuff, it was a sham cuff, it was 45 minutes. Other, the other parameters were the same, still 40% VO2 max, it was just longer period of time without the cuff. And then we, they used an MRI to get the cross-sectional area, uh, strength testing with the dynamometer, and um, VO2 max determined with progressive exercise test and monitor. So what we found here was you get an increase in the VO2 max with the VFR cycling versus a control. Remember, this is 15 minutes versus 45. More efficient. Time to exhaustion, more endurance with the VFR group, even though they were only going for 15 minutes. More hypertrophy. There were strength gains, but they were not considered significant in either group. So you can work smarter, not harder, with the blood flow restriction. It's tough. 15 minutes on a bike would be tough. I'll tell you, I can do 10, and it's, I mean, I'm, I'm not a cyclist, per se, but you, you, 10's really hard. So you have to work your way up to 15. It's not just something you can go right at the gates with. Um, there's been enough research or systematic reviews or meta-analyses. Um, this was from 2012 to compare the effects of low-intensity exercise to low-intensity exercise with blood flow restriction. And to try to identify which training variables were the best would result in the greatest strength and hypertrophy outcomes. So the results show, again, I know this is getting redundant a little bit, but you got to hammer it home, and there's evidence to support this. Low intensity resistance training alone does not provide an adequate stimulus to produce substantial increases in strength or hypertrophy. But the same exact exercises with the cuff, you will get results comparable to high intensity training. Um, this is from the same meta-analysis, the effect size. This is exactly what I just talked about. This is low-intensity training alone versus low-intensity training with blood flow restriction. 
the training frequency, the best frequency um, as far as what we can tell now from research is two to three days a week versus four to five days a week. You'll see greater gains in strength and hypertrophy here. This is an evidence-based progressive model based on the use of blood flow restriction. It can change the way we think about how we conduct someone's rehab from the very start to the very end of the rehab process. Traditionally, there's not much bed rest, you know, necessarily anymore, but um, they're even actually using this in the ICU, um, and especially in Europe. Um, there's studies being conducted, you know, if someone literally can't, you know, can just stay in bed, could this help uh, retard some of the atrophy? Um, so normally, someone can't do anything in bed, maybe some ankle pumps, their strength is going to diminish, okay, they're going to get atrophy. Then they can get mobile, they can get out of bed, they can start walking. I don't know that you're necessarily going to see strength gains. It's saying it's equivocal. You know, it's really neuromuscular education during that phase. And I, I think that's what we do a lot as therapists, especially in the post-surgical patient. We establish neuromuscular re-education. We get them to fire their quad again. They can walk again. They can do a squat. They can go upstairs. Are we getting to the point where we're actually building girth and true strength, or is it just neuromuscular education? Down the road, I think we can do that. But insurance limitations, compliance, Things like that get in our way. Um, and then, you know, finally, we're going to add weights and resistance training. Then we're going to see, hopefully, some strength gains. Well, now we can accelerate that process with blood flow restriction, potentially. So uh, during the bed rest phase, instead of a loss of mass, maybe we're just going to keep them the same or, or help stave off some of that atrophy. Walking with a cup, um, we can increase strength now instead of just, just providing neuromuscular education. There's another systematic review just last month, October 2018. Blood flow restriction in the older, in the elderly population. Um, walking and low load training more effective than walking and low load training for strength teams without the cup. Um, sarcopenia. Can this stave off some of the effects of sarcopenia? NASA is, is uh, using this now in space instead of bringing heavy equipment up. Can you just bring the cuffs up? And you know you're in that non that limited weight bearing environment. Could you help get strength gains there? There's a lot of uses um, that we may see on the horizon here. And then you know finally we're adding resistance plus BFR. Well, now we're going to get better strength gains than we would without it at a lower load, less stress on the joints. So this is just a new way to think about a progression um, based on evidence. Um, another systematic review um, compared low load training with BFR training. It's more effective, tolerable, and therefore a potential clinical re rehabilitation tool. There's a need for development of an individualized approach to training prescription to minimize risk and increase effectiveness. It's true. Um, and especially as this becomes more popular, I'm, all, I'm, I'm very surprised just based on the level of research and its use in the athletic population that we don't hear more about this just across the board in the rehab setting. I almost feel like we're on like the cusp of an explosion of this. So that's going to mean more and more products on the market for this. We got to think about what's the safest product for our patient. You, we really should be using something that is individualized. We can't just necessarily use one pressure for everybody. Okay, that's the safest way to go about it. The gold standard is to use this Delphi system right now. It's the best that's available. And then conducting studies down the road on ACL, microfracture, rotator cuff repair. Um, one thing I should mention too is, you know, we talk about the rotator cuff. It's that's going to be proximal to the cuff, right? So, again, that there's pro, there's studies on bench pressing, there's study on glute strengthening that you still are going to get better strength gains with the cuff than without it. It's not as significant as distal structures, but the systemic effects that what's circulating in our bloodstream is probably what's responsible for that. And then the, the fatiguing of some of these other structures distally, you're going to have to use those, those, those more proximal structures to stabilize more quickly as well. Um, but as we're doing more studies with the post-op population, hopefully the protocols will be developed that are more specific, more specific use of this in that, in that population. Now, Greg's going to talk specifically about the exercise prescription. That's Rick, by the way. Just <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Training frequency. The recommendation that Rick uh, mentioned earlier is two to three times a week. 
You can do it daily. You can do it twice a week. And if you're Russell Wilson, you can do it three times a day. So at the start of the 2016 football season, uh, he sprained his ankle, and then a couple weeks later, he actually uh, like sprained his MCL. Um, he was utilizing this with a PT out in California named Drew Marcos, um, and he was able to play. I mean, he wore a brace still, but he was uh, much more stable than somebody with the type of injury that he sustained should have been at that point. Training duration, the recommendation is 10 weeks. It's the same as a high intensity training program. However, as Rick also mentioned, we were talking about the neuromuscular re-education component. Um, in the first, whenever we make significant strength gains, it's usually in the beginning, it's usually because of neuromuscular junction recruitment and neuromuscular unit recruitment. Um, and then here, you can actually see hypertrophy in as early as two weeks with BFR versus the high intensity training. Uh, so the recommendation for like prescription of reps is 30 repetitions followed by a 30 second break, 15 repetitions, 30 second break, 15 reps, 30 second break, 15 reps, one minute break, and then usually you'll switch over to a new exercise. Um, the reason we do these 30 repetitions to begin with is we're trying to prime the muscle. We want to pump out all the oxygen out of that muscle so that we're utilizing that core cycle. We're utilizing anaerobic metabolism producing that lactate. Um, that's pretty significant just because some people will, when your patients will try to like pump it out as fast as you can, you want to try to slow them down. I mean, you want to try to up for two, down for two, try to make them do some hold stuff along those lines because that will increase that lactate production. So the tourniquet cuff pressure, it varies individual to individual and from session to session. So determined, and it's determined by the personal tourniquet pressure, which we'll review during the demo, and limb occlusion pressure. So depending on the body uh, part, it'll be upper extremity is 50% the limb occlusion pressure, and lower extremity is 80% limb occlusion pressure. So basically the limb occlusion pressure would be the amount of millimeters mercury to turn off blood flow completely to that extremity. Um, so there's some type, the arterial blood flow is still going into the area, but again, there's no venous return. The extra training intensity uh, depends on what you're doing. A load of 15 to 30% of your one rep max or max voluntary contraction, and it depends on the exercise, as I said. A load of less than 15 to 30% is recommended for walking, cycling, and isometrics. And there is a nutritional recommendation. Um, we try to recommend 24 grams of protein to our patients every four hours after BFR treatment. And then if they're elderly, 40 grams of protein to the elderly patient four hours after BFR treatment. Um, and again, this could prevent some of the effects of aging in that elderly population. Um, according to the cell swelling theory, we're sparing protein so that protein can go into building up our muscles even further. So, all right, at this time, we will show you a video on how we set up the cup. So personal blood flow restriction demo. So this is the sleeve tourniquet setup. My lovely assistant, Erin, and uh, Mr. Sal Pagano. Uh, she's checking out the cup to see if there's any wear and tear of the cup. She's also checking out the hose just to see if uh, there's any kinks or any damage to the hose because that would affect the amount of air getting into the cup. We want to stick a barrier between the sleeve and the tourniquet, or between the skin and the tourniquet. This will prevent bruising and any type of skin breakdown because uh, the tourniquet can't does get a little tight, obviously, for restricting blood flow. We're going to strap it on. We want to try to get it as proximal on the extremity as possible. So for him, we want to try to get it, we're getting it above that brachial area as close, as high as we can. Um, some people's arms are longer or shorter than others, but if you see she's shifting it up as high as she can, and then we're tightening it up. All right. Limb occlusion pressure reading. So basically, when you do this part of the treatment you are set up, you're having the patient lie supine. No cell phones in the pockets. I tell my patients, don't even think about moving. So they're just laying completely flat, and they're going to stay there. Um, at this time, we're pressing the appropriate buttons to get. So 
It's going to get the personal tourniquet pressure. It's going to check, okay, 50% limb occlusion pressure because we're on the upper extremity. And then we're going to set it, and now it's gauging it. So this takes a little bit of time, um, but basically the air is going in, and it's just, it can sense the blood pressure throughout the body. So that's why the numbers are going up and down, and then it'll jump up, and then it'll take a little bit of time, unfortunately. But um, I mean, and we reach, so <laughs> as if we're in the clinic. So, um, <laughs> all right, so his limb occlusion pressure is going to be 165. So it would take 165 millimeters of mercury to occlude it completely. And then we would, it would be 82, I think it was, yeah. for his 50%. So here's some, <coughs> oh, here's some upper extremity exercises. So um, you, did, you can do biceps curls. It would be lovely to have two blood flow restriction cuffs in our clinics, but um, right now we have the one and we're seeing some pretty good results. So uh, he's up two, down two. Up two, down two. Triceps extension. Sal was a great uh, participant. I mean, he, he loved this machine, so it worked really hard. <laughs> extension, good. And you actually don't want to use a lot of weight. Like you said, can you combine high intensity training with the cuff? The problem is you're going to get such a muscular contraction that you're going to, the venous return, you're going to force that blood flow back out. Okay. And there, the study is no better results with the high intensity with the cuff. You have a patient that can do 75 push-ups with this on, they're in great shape. Um, I, Sal, Sal was doing uh, was it, curls with the 10 pounders, and I can guarantee you he did not complete that. Um, he did not do 75 reps. You can get any creative, you can do inverted rows. Um, that's the beauty of this machine. I mean, you can get creative. It seems a little limiting because you have a cord, but I mean, you can get creative. You might just have to hold onto the cord and avoid it. Rick's going to talk to you about some lower extremity exercises. So uh, this, it, it really doesn't take up much space. That's one of the beauties of this. You get a lot of bang for your buck. There's also a backpack that you can get that you can, you know, the patient can wear and walk around the clinic with it. Um, this is just shows biking with the cuff, which again, I, this can increase VO2 max, endurance, hypertrophy. Um, and you probably saw, you, you just listen to the patient. If they can only make it five minutes, that's the point you stop at. The same with the sets, you know, the 30, 15, 15, 15. If they may only make it through one set of 15, they may be done. You're still going to get positive effects. This is where you stop. Um, this is something that I kind of do across the board with the lower extremity. Um, for lower extremity strength, thing that I see patients with is a straight leg raise. you notice she has a different size cuff on. So there's different size cuffs based on the circumference of the limb. Um, in this video, if you look closely, you can see kind of a, the pinkish color of the, the skin. So you will notice that in the arms and the legs. It, it's pink because you still have arterial blood flow in there. You're just not getting the venous return. As soon as the cuff's deflated, you know, the color starts to return. This would be a great closed chain exercise. Um, the use of a single leg press, lightweight, um, with the blood flow restriction. You notice it's only one plate, so it's pretty significant. You can do this functionally, step ups, um, throwing. There's a lot of easy, it's easy to administer in good use. So you could take a look here, and, and you know which arm he was doing the curls with, but I think you'd be able to tell. This is immediately afterwards. You see the swell, the, the uh, muscle swelling. It's like you're going to feel and look after a high-intensity workout. Most patients, you know, right afterwards will say, oh, man, look at my thigh. And uh, the other thing that we should mention is this one I can't <laughs> go to my big book and, and prove is uh, pain relief. A lot of patients report pain relief after this intervention. And they are doing some studies there too, maybe like a release of endogenous opioids type of thing. But I've had many patients tell me that they feel great after they do it. And special thanks to uh, Erin Wright, PTA. I don't even know. She signed off the disclaimer, but I don't know if she knew that I would make using this video for our presentation. <laughs> 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 so, thank you. So what questions do we have? You were talking about dosage parameters yeah. as far as sets, if the patient feels fatigued after one set, is that necessarily per muscle group or say for example if you're doing the biceps around the arm, yeah. you do one set of, or excuse me, four sets technically for the biceps and you move on the triceps, how exactly does that work? Is it You should try to kind of isolate what, like, why you're doing it. I mean if it's a squat you're getting a lot of kosher tracks. Like with a bicep, if they couldn't do any more after 15, like let's say they did 30 and 15, mm -hmm. 
I wouldn't then have them do, I wouldn't keep it on and then have them do tricep extensions for the next two sets of 15. Um, I would deflate it and then restart it again and try to isolate the triceps if that's what I want to work on. So, so you're so, recommending four sets technically for region, not necessarily yeah. body or muscle group. So like for each um, each exercise, we want 75 repetitions. So say we're working on the bicep, bicep curls, Sal would be doing 75 repetitions. So 30, 30 sure. second break, 15, 30 second break, and 15, 30 second break, 15. So, and then we would move on to our next body part. So if we wanted okay. to work on the tricep, then we would go 75 repetitions. Um, the way that I've been doing it, and first correct me if you ever just add, jump in, I do uh, four exercises for the introductory period just to get them sort of familiar with what we're doing. Um, I also get a little creative sometimes, uh, have them do stoolie rides. So basically it's when you put them on the stool and they have to use their uh, heel to dig in. Uh, I don't have them do like 30 repetitions. I have them go for like a minute and a half and then we'll take a 30 second break, a minute, 30 second break. So that's what's the beauty of it. That's what's recommended. We can get a little bit creative in the clinic sometimes and see some positive results. So um, I usually give somebody one to two exercises the first day and do it because there's kind of like an adjustment period. Like I found it can be difficult that first day to get through them. And then after that, there's like a big gain and they like kind of crave it. They want to do more with it. But there, it does, it's not for everyone. Okay. It doesn't feel great the first time you do it, especially. It's hard. Um, you get that burn in there. Yeah, it's per muscle group we try to isolate. And the other thing you can do is if someone can't tolerate it is to back off the occlusion pressure. So instead of using 80% for the limb, you can do 70, you can do 60. You just run the risk that you're not going to get as, as many positive effects. But until they can build their tolerance, um, I've done that before. Thank you. They mentioned they're using it in intensive care unit, which implies a hospital. Um, yeah in Europe, but I take a look at the precautions and the contraindications, and I can't think of one patient in our intensive care unit we could use it on. Yeah. Um, so are they, do they have a special protocol that's different than the outpatient population? I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. I don't know if there's, like, they think of it on a case-to-case -case basis, the doctor's size is worth, you know, the use. But I thought about that, too, and that's a good question. I'm not sure what the answer is there. Yeah, I believe that it's just more to prevent like the orthostatic hypotension. So it's your patients that are in comas. So like they might be stable in other aspects. I mean, I'm in the hospital as well sometimes, and I know there's a lot of comorbidities with a lot of these patients, those patients specifically. But if the patient's in a coma, imagine if we're trying to get them standing up for the first time. This would prevent against the positive, the negative effects of like orthostatic hypotension if they're in coma for long periods of time. And I believe that was how they were utilizing it over in Europe. So um, I mean, pr pretty fascinating, but again, like not for everybody in the ICU. So they use it with a CPM and. I mean, that's definitely a possible. I mean, I don't see why not. It's going to be positive effects. The CPM is not going to cause too much of a muscle contraction. That's going to pump out the metabolites from the region and basically like destroy what we're trying to build. So I think it could definitely be beneficial if you used it with the CPM. So that'd be pretty pretty fascinating. And what you're saying there, the CPM just made me think of something else. You can use this with NMES. Okay, so it's, that's another good modality to use it in conjunction with. You've done that uh, quite a few times. With uh. uh Telephenol dysfunction. I've had some pretty great results. I mean, an individual was only able to go like about 45 degrees. Uh, she was actually able to go like butt to ground, which was pretty awesome because we stimulated it by firing up the VMO using the NRE. So um, I just thought that's just like a, something that we see commonly. Um, and I mean, th you can actually see a nice contraction. I mean, sometimes we put it on and you get like a little like fibrillation or something. It's not the most uh, gratifying image that you've ever seen. When you put on the VFR, you see a nice contraction. So that's pretty pretty awesome about this device as well. Thank you guys for the presentation. I was wondering, um, you know, with ox the some patients use the oxygen mask to limit oxygen to the body. Would that have similar effects, or do you know the research on that as well, on how that relates to VFR? So there's. Uh, guy UFC, I, was it Robo QB's dad? I forget the player's name, but he was. They had something in a health magazine where he was having basically their UFC fighters trained with like gas masks on and like doing dips. And the 
the thought process is, is that basically acute hypoxic environments are going to elicit similar type of effects systemically. You're not going to isolate specifically that area, but this is going to be more of the metabolite theory and we're going to get more of like specified and really hit that region. I mean, how many patients do you really know that are going to be able to throw on a gas mask and throw some chains on their neck and start doing some dips? I really don't know too many of those. That would probably be more sports performance uh, to like aid in that type of... Uh, yeah, I think you could find some similarities in some of the training variables, like some of the things you're trying to do. One of the main differences is you're not keeping those metabolites within the musculature that you use. There's not a, a restriction that's precluding venous return. So one, of the, one of the main things with the blood pressure restriction is you're getting these metabolites and then you're keeping them in the muscle that you're trying to target. Now, how often are you guys reading the occlusion pressure? Like I said, you know, if you're doing bicep curls, do that, you take it off from the rest. Now, if you put it back on and refine that after that first exercise, you just take that first read and roll we that. We take it every single time they come in. So not between exercises. Oh, yeah. If we were to switch sides, we even take the per like personal tourniquet pressure on the other side as well. Um, rarely does that happen, mm -hmm. but I mean, um, as I said, like we like switch it up depending on what the diagnosis is. So. As soon as they're they're done with their exercise, 30, 15, 15, 15, you hit the deflate button, it automatically sets a one minute timer for a rest. It won't reinflate right after that minute unless you hit the button, but it builds in that rest. You'll see the, the numbers be variable as you're doing a curl, it tries to sustain it. So it doesn't just stay, let's say it's 144, I'm just making up a number. It wouldn't just stay at 144 all the time. You're gonna see these little fluctuations but it tries to keep it as consistent as it can. Okay. Um, but then, yeah, I wouldn't take it again for the next exercise. Okay. You guys read anything about the use of this with somebody with like a brain injury, uh, stroke, anything like that? Only on like, so there's like a message board for blood flow restriction and people ask questions about using it in that population. Um, and I can't tell you anything specifically as far as like results, but there's interest in doing it. Um, but I have not read any studies on the use of it in that, like a neurologic population. And as we said, like new parameters are being developed on a regular basis. I mean, the new research with Dr. Andrews and uh, PRP draws, uh, I'm sure that there's going to be research on some of that. I mean, to me, it would make sense because if in stroke patients, if we were to strengthen one side, we see some positive gains. I mean, as long as they're not going to have, the only issue would be the contraindications. So I don't think, I mean, unless they change the parameters, I don't foresee any like pos like positive effects, but I mean again, th that's what we're doing research for. So, one more question. So, um, are are all the clinics getting these, or like how much do they cost, and like how? This, how this unit costs uh, six thousand dollars. They're all said and done with cuffs and everything like that. Um, so so far, just Moravian and McCunji had them. Mm -hmm. um, I would. I don't want to speak for for St. Luke's. I would think the plan would be to get get them in more clinics. That would be the, the that's 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 what we hope for. So we'll be the first, and uh, we'll really take a grasp of the game in the blood flow restriction uh, arena in the area. So um, and it's just to help our patients get better. That's what the truck fire, um, fired up us to get us like. Basically, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied, but I'm just thinking about a patient. That individual, he had a foot surgery, nerve block, basically uh, nerve damage, and his doctor, who's based out in like Chicago, wanted him to do blood flow restriction. When I initially thought about it, I thought it was like the barbaric version of like, like for lack of a better term, meatheads with like straps around their arms and stuff. It is not. And uh, I spoke to Rick. Rick was like, hey, there's a course, uh, it's Owens Recovery Science. The following week, I went and took a course. So basically, what motivates us is just like trying to get our patients better at a, and at a faster rate. Because I mean, we're trying to get them back to whether it's picking up their grandchildren, back on the field, or something along those lines. So hopefully, we do get these in every clinic. So we're starting to get specific referrals for the use of this, which is good. That's exciting. A lot of it's edu we're doing a lot of education right now in the community for specifically orthopedic groups and others. Sure. question. No. Yeah. They, they know that they know. Okay. Well, thank you guys very, very much. If you're a new friend who'd like to see, make sure you sign out. Uh, also, make sure you leave your feedback. We appreciate you guys coming. Have a happy new year and happy holidays. Yeah. <laughs>